أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم القارعة ما القارعة وما أدراك ما القارعة يوم يكون الناس كالفراش المبثوث وتكون الجبال كالعهن المنفوش فأما من ثقلت موازينه فهو في عيشة راضية وأما من خفت موازينه فأمه هاوية وما أدراك ما هي نار حامية Now we begin inshallah ta'ala with the discussion of the surah itself القارعة ما القارعة وَمَا أَذْرَاكَ مَا الْقَارِعَةِ We're going to bunch these three ayat together because they're very similar. Al-Qari'ah, if you want to be very basic and raw in translation, that which rattles, the rattler, okay, or the knocker, or the destroyer even. It's, Allah is describing something that engages in the act of something. The noun is something by definition that engages in the act of something. This is an ism fa'il. Now, the thing of it is, the word qari'ah in Arabic is used specifically, qara'a as a verb is used when two things hit against each other, and they produce a loud noise. A loud, not just loud, but disturbing noise. If you are not disturbed by the noise, you will not call it, will you not use the word qara'a for it. But if you're perturbed by it, annoyed by it, scared by it, then you will call it al qari'a. Okay? For example, if two cars crash into each other, and you hear a loud, loud sound, you, would, you can call that qari'a. Why? Because it disturbed you. Of course, the most common usage of it is qara' al-bab. To knock on the door in the middle of the night when people are sleeping and when you knock really hard, what happens? It disturbs their sleep. It bothers them and their peace is gone. And of course, a few things happen. First of all, you weren't expecting it. Second of all, it disturbed your peace. Third of all, you're even scared. Fourth of all, you don't know who's there. You don't know what this is about. It comes as a shock to you. right? So there are lots of things happening with al qariah Allah uses this as one of the descriptions of the Day of Judgment. Al-Azifa, Al-Tammatu Al-Kubra, right? al sahha There are many different descriptions of the Day of Judgment. This is one of them. And the, the use of the benefit of this word, from a liter- literary point of view is, what Allah is teaching us about the Day of Judgment is, it is like that night visitor who comes all of a sudden, and you weren't expecting him. And when he comes, when this Day of Judgment comes, you're going to be what? You're going to be shocked? You're not going to be expecting it? And the, the rattling noise is going to wake you up, meaning right now you are what? Asleep. You're asleep and it's going to come and it's going to wake you up. And when it wakes you up, you won't know what hit you. You don't know what's going on. Which has been described in Surah Al-Zilzal already because the human being said, مَا لَهَا What's wrong with it? What just happened? The, the shock will, ca- will capture you. So the word Al-Qari'ah is very descriptive in regards to the Day of Judgment. It's very beautiful usage. So now, now let's talk a little bit more about the, the traditional interpretation of the word qari'a. We'll look at the tafsir of al-Shawkani, al-Lusi and others. I'm just gonna read off some things in Arabic and translate for you quickly. وَالْقَارِعَةُ مِنَ الْقَرْعَ وَهُوَ الضَّرْبْ بِاعْتِمَادٍ شَدِيدٍ Qari'a comes from the word qari'a, which means to strike with great resolve. Meaning strike something really hard. You meant to hit it. You know there's sometimes you, meet, you hit something by accident. Qari'a can't be that. It has to be بِاعْتِمَادٍ شَدِيدٍ مُعْتَمِدْ on purpose. And you hit it really hard on purpose. وَهِيَ مِنْ أَسْمَاءِ الْقِيَامَةِ فِي الْقُرْآنِ And it's of course from the names of Resurrection Day in the Qur'an. قِيلَ سُمِّيَتْ بِهَا لِأَنَّهَا تَقْرَعُ الْقُلُوبِ بِالْفَزْعِ It is said that it's called Al-Qari'ah because on that day hearts will be rattled out of fear. وَتَقْرَعُ أَعْدَاءَ اللَّهِ بِالْعَذَابِ uh, or a'da'u Allah bil adab, and it's called the day of judgment because the, the enemies of Allah will be rattled on that day because of punishment. So that's one opinion we find traditionally. وَقَدْ أَكَّدَ هَذَا التَّعْظِيمُ وَالتَّفْخِيمُ بِقَوْلِهِ بَعْدْ وَمَا أَدْرَاكَ مَا الْقَارِعَ وَمَا أَدْرَاكَ مَا الْقَارِعَ And it said that Allah Azza wa Jalla repeated the word three times to let you know how heavy this calamity is. So the three times repetition makes it three times as heavy and emphatic. The ta'zim to, to make it grand, a tafhim to make it heavier and to make it scarier. But I want to share with you a brilliant discussion that a Shaykh Sha'rawi rahimahullah had in regards to these three ayat. This is the this is one of two surahs in which this style is the beginning of the surah. Al Qari'atu, Mal Qari'atu, Wama Adraka, Mal Qari'ah, Al Haqatu, 
ما الحاقة وما أدراك ما الحاقة now القارعة we just said the rattler the loud noise okay then or the destructive noise what is the destructive noise ما القارعة then a third وما أدراك ما القارعة what will give you any clue what this destructive noise is three times القارعة the word occurs three times القارعة ما القارعة وما أدراك ما القارعة by the way in the Quran as we will see later on this word occurs a total of five times of them, three times right here. So two more times left. Okay, elsewhere in the Quran. But we get to that a little bit later. The point I'm trying to come bring to your attention, first of all, kalimatun takarrat thalathat marra. This is a word that has been repeated three times. But then al mar al ula ka'anna fihi ibham. The first time it is mentioned, it is as though there is some ambiguity in it. It's not explicitly clear. In other words, when you just say a word. In Arabic, especially when you put al on a word, this is considered a mubtada. It's the opening of a sentence. And when you say the opening of a sentence, what does the listener expect? The closing, the subject. The, if the subject is mentioned, they expect the predicate. For example, if I said to you, the city of Dallas, and I didn't say anything more. You're left, the, the reader is left thinking, what about the city of Dallas? You know, there's confusion. What, what do you want to tell me? You didn't finish what you were going to say. Allah says al qari'ah, but He doesn't finish it. The ayah is done. What question comes in your mind? The question that comes in your mind is, what calamity? What rattling? When that question is produced in your mind, it is as though Allah Azza wa reads your mind and says what in the next ayah? Mal qari'ah. Are you wondering what this qari'ah is? And whenever there's a question asked, whenever there's a question asked, the principle is, ibhamun yad'ul insan an yas ala mal qari'ah. The, the ambiguity makes the human being question, what is al qari'ah? What is it? And so naturally the next ayah is Mal Qari'ah. But whenever you have a question, then you it necessitates the Yatatallabul Jawab. It, it demands an answer. It demands an answer. And as soon as the, the curiosity and the, the desire to seek an answer is produced in the mind, Allah Azza wa lets us know you can't know for yourself. There's no way you can get the answer to that unless I give it to you. What would give you any clue? What would give you even the slightest idea what al qariah happens to be? Now we come to the next ayah. يَوْمَ يَكُونُ النَّاسُ كَالْفَرَاشِ الْمَبْثُوثِ Allah says the day on which people are going to be كَالْفَرَاشِ الْمَبْثُوثِ Farash are moths. Moths. It's also the bugs that are, you know when you turn a light on, all these little tiny bugs trying to hit the light, and they're going in every direction. Those, those are farash. The plural of farasha actually in Arabic. Okay? These bugs, Allah says people will be like farash, these little tiny bugs going in every which direction, these moths, al-mabthuth. <coughs> this is the adjective given to them, dispersed, spread out. Now farash by itself is spread out, but he made it even more spread out by the word al-mabthuth, and this parallel is being given to people. This scene, is this an individual scene or a collective scene? This is a collective scene, so the word nas is more appropriate. The word nas is here, more suited. Okay. Now, batha to be widespread. Now, what are the benefits of using this, uh, uh, this image, al-farash al-mabthuth, with people on the Day of Judgment? First of all, there's, there's many, 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 there are countless bugs, there are countless insects, insects going in every which direction. Then there's chaos in them. They're not moving in one direction or another direction, they're going in every which direction. And they're even running into each other. They're even running into each other. And so by using this parallel of us with al-farash al-mabthuth, Allah is describing the chaos we're going to look like on the Day of Judgment. This is what's going to happen. In other words, when that rattling sound happens, you will be so wrecked, you will be so shocked, that this is what's going to happen to all of you. يَوْمَ يَكُونُ النَّاسُ كَالْفَرَاشِ الْمَبْثُوثِ قِيلَ شُبِّهَ النَّاسُ عِنْدَ الْبَعْثِ بِالْفَرَاشِ لِأَنَّ الْفَرَاشِ إِذَا ثَارَ لَمْ يَتَّجِهْ إِلَى جِهَةٍ وَاحِدَةٍ it said that people will be people are given uh, or alluded to by making a, a reference to these moths that are scattered in every direction because when they move they don't move in one direction like birds that move in a flock and they go in one direction as opposed to them وَكَذَلِكَ النَّاسِ إِذَا خَرَجُوا مِنْ قُبُورِهِمْ أَحَاطَ بِهِمُ الْفَزْعَ and just like that, and additionally, when people come out of their graves, they will be overwhelmed by terror, just like these bugs, that it's an image of chaos. When you see all that motion happening at the same time, it's an image of chaos and dis- disturbance. فَتَوَجَّهُ جِهَاتٍ شَتَّى أَوْ تَوَجَّهُ إِلَى مَنَازِلِهِمُ الْمُخْتَلِفَةِ سُعَادَ وَشِقَاءَ 
what he's saying is that they're going to be going in every which direction and eventually end up in one of two, the direction of happiness or the direction of calamity and, uh, and sadness. وَالْمَبْثُوثُ مِنَ الْبَثْ وَهُوَ التَّفْرِيقُ And مبثوث, the word مبثوث, which is an ism مفعول, an objective noun, comes from the word بث, and it means division, distinction. So they'll be separated from one another. Even though they're together, they're also separated. Which is a, a, an incredible thing. That on the Day of Judgment, we will be the biggest gathering ever of human beings. Because all generations of human beings are coming together at one point. And yet, this will be the day you will feel the loneliest. You'll be the most alone. You'll be separated from everybody else. And this is described in further more explicit detail. يَوْمَ يَفِرُّ الْمَرْءُ مِنْ أَخِيهِ وَأُمِّهِ وَأَبِيهِ وَصَاحِبَتِهِ وَبَنِيهِ Right in Surah Al-Mu'arij إِبْنِ وَفَصِيلَتِهِ الَّتِي تُؤْوِيهِ وَمَنْ فِي الْأَرْضِ جَمِيعًا ثُمَّ يُؤْوِيهِ Right? So, ثُمَّ يُنْجِيهِ Right? He's, he, he offers Allah everybody. He even says, separate me from my tribe in addition to my family. How about this? Why don't you take everyone on earth into hell? Let me go. He'll offer everybody else. Right? وَمَنْ فِي الْأَرْضِ جَمِيعًا ثُمَّ يُنْجِيهِ give, give everybody else up. Just let me survive. That's what he's concerned about. So that you become completely individualized on that day. وَتَكُونُ الْجِبَالُ كَلْعِهْنِ الْمَنْفُوشِ and mountains will become on that day like al-ihn. Al-ihn in the Arabic language is wool of different textures. So when Allah makes reference to this kind of carding, usually it's associated with cotton, but in Arab society, the first thing that came to their mind was wool. So al-ihn is used wool. And then Allah uses the word al-manfush. The word nafasha in Arabic is to card and scrape into fine lines. You know when you card and scrape the wool, it becomes fine fibers? And then they're brought together and intertwined. And al ihn is used for, for wool that is of multiple textures. And when you're carding, you know what happens? These really fine fibers, they start flying up into the air. They become weightless and there's this, you know, so you have to wear some corset, I think, because you're going to get like, it's the dust of it is going to go in your, you know, kind of like sawdust kind of thing. But this happens with wool a lot. So Allah is describing mountains as this weightless thing that when it's scraped, it's almost like it's flying in the air. And the different textures of it implied inside the word al ihn benefits us in that mountains are of different colors. But they're going to be slammed together and scraped together to the point where first of all, there's this different colored textured dust coming out of them, just like wool, when they're scraped together, subhanAllah. And, so we're, and we're, being, we're learning that mountains will not stay in, in one place. Because the mountainous region of one place is of one color, and the mountainous region of another place is a different color, but now they're all slamming into each other, they're making moves towards each other, subhanAllah. So, وَتَكُونُ الْجِبَالُ كَلِعْنِ الْمَنْفُوشِ فَأَمَّا مَنْ ثَقُلَتْ مَوَازِينُهُ Now we get to the final part. And as for the one whose scales, I'm roughly translating, uh, as for the one whose scales became heavy. You know what's incredible about that? An ayah ago, mountains became weightless. And now what's becoming heavy? The scales. It's a beautiful contrast. It's inc- incredible. This is a day when everything's changed. You know, in, in this dunya right now, when you do, do good deeds, everybody around you says this is worthless. There's no way to it. And when they see a mountain, the first thing to their mind is, this is solid. Because their vision is that of what they can see, they accept. What they cannot see, they don't accept. But on the Day of Judgment, Allah Azza wa reverses this. And so the mountains become weightless, and your deeds are now heavy. They've been given. ثَقُلَتْ mawazin. What an amazing contrast in this surah. Then he says, okay, so if the deeds become heavy, فَهُوَ فِي عِيشَةٍ رَاضِيَةٍ Then he will be in عِيشَةٍ now, Isha is different from Hayat. In the you know, English translation, Isha, Hayat translated as life. Okay? Uh, Isha comes from Aish. Aish in Arabic. Which means to have a life in which you have no worry of food and shelter. Okay? Any life is Hayat. Akhas minhu, Isha. Isha, there, there is no worry about food and shelter. Meaning, the necessities of your life are not a concern for you at all. Then you are in Aish. Those of you who speak Arabic, or, or Urdu rather, Aish karrein. Right? You know what that means? Oh, we're living it up. No worries. Right? That's, it's kind of derived from there. But the Arabic meaning originally is, is exactly that. It's to have a, a life free of concern. فَهُوَ فِي عِيشَةٍ Then there's the word رَاضِيَةٍ The word رَاضِيَةٍ literally means the one who is pleased. Literally it means the one who is pleased. So as an adjective of Isha, it's, it's actually unique. A life that is pleased. Hmm. A life full... Full of pleasure, ذاتي ربان, which is how some of us have interpreted it, is correct. A life that is full of contentment. But in the in Arabic rhetoric, 
you can say, you know, uh, 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 an overjoyed life. You didn't describe the person, you described the life. Right? You didn't describe the person, but you described the life. And this is so to understand that this, the entire life, not a moment, not a breath will go by where the joy won't be there. Not where the joy will be missing. Where the contentment will be missing. There will not be a moment of boredom or, or of, you know, of dissatisfaction. So, عِيشَةٍ رَاضِيَةٍ ذَاتِ رِضًا As for example, Al-Alusi rahimahullah says. So now we come to the, the, the horrifying next ayah, وَأَمَّا مَنْ خَفَّتْ مَوَازِينُهُ As for the ones whose scales are lightened. تَخْفِيف in Arabic, to lighten. And you know what's really cool about this? On the Day of Judgment, we want this huge burden of good deeds, right? But in this dunya, when Allah gives us ahkam, you know what He says? يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ لِيُخَفِّفَ عَنْكُمْ Allah intends to lighten your burden from you. In other words, when you follow Allah's commandments, life in this world becomes light. Light. Life becomes easy and your scales are getting heavier in the Day of Judgment. The contrast between the two things in the Qur'an's language. وَالظَّاهِرْ أَنَّ الْمُرَادْ بِهَا بِهَاوِيَا جَهَنَّمِ So he says, وَأَمَّا مَنْ خَفَتْ مَوَازِينُهُ فَأُمُّهُ هَاوِيَا And as for the one whose scales became lightened, the ayah ended, it didn't go straight to فَأُمُّهُ هَاوِيَا It stopped there because he wants you to think. As for the one whose scales became light, you stop there. You don't just go straight to فَأُمُّهُ هَاوِيَا لِيَدَّبَّرُوا آيَاتِ You reflect on every single ayah. You stop and reflect on it. And Allah Azza wa Jal adds, now He teaches. He says, فَأُمُّهُ هَاوِيَا Both words, very very powerful. The word هَاوِيَا first. We'll come to um, which is even scarier second. We'll come to هَاوِيَا first. The word هَاوِي in Arabic comes from هُوَا which actually means to fall into a steep canyon. And it's usually used for a hawk or a bird of prey that sees an animal way down at the bottom of the valley, and what does it do? It dives down at full speed. It's faster than even falling. When you're falling down, all you have to your advantage is gravity. But the bird is even forcing itself to launch itself further down, way, way deep into the valley to snatch its prey. That's what it's trying to do. In Arabic idiom, you know, uh, actually I'll, t- I'll tell you the idiom at the end. The word Hawiyah is referred to by Imam Madhari rahimahullah. He says that this is a canyon in hellfire so deep that only Allah knows its depth. So first of all, the location is such, and the one falling in it, or the one going to Hawiyah is what? Endlessly just falling way, 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 way down. That's described just in the word Hawiyah. But then we find this really interesting expression of the Arabs. They would say for somebody who's having a really, really hard time, or they're like... Uh, uh, they're in, 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 in horrible, horrible calamity. They would say, huwat ummuhu. Same verb is used. Hawiya, huwat ummuhu. What that means is, his mother fell off a cliff into a deep canyon. They don't really mean his mother fell off a cliff. They're saying, man, you're looking like your mother fell off a cliff. But she dove right in. Just, that's how you look. You look that depressed, you look that disturbed. Now, both words are used in the ayah, but the arrangement is changed. So Allah took the expression of the Arabs, but did something new with it. And this is again a feature of the Qur'an. فَأُمُّهُ هَاوِيَ Then his mother, I'm translating literally, his mother is the deep canyon in hellfire. His mother is that deep canyon in hell. Okay. What does it mean, his mother? Ummu. We learn a few things from that. First of all, a child, it runs to its mother. And whether you like it or not, if the, if the person is headed for hellfire, they will run towards it whether they want to or not. Who wants to run to hellfire? Nobody. A child, you don't have to tell them to want to run to their mother, they naturally run to their mother. But on the day of judgment, your body will rebel against you, no matter how much you want to run away from it. وَيَصْلَى سَعِيرًا First he will say, give me death, don't take me there, and then he'll throw himself in. He'll go himself, jump in himself, because he can't even help himself at this point. Just like a child can't help himself run towards its mother. The other benefit of the word ummuhu here is, a mother wraps its child around and protects it and doesn't let it go. It's the sense of motherhood that she has. And also a mother, when she's carrying the baby, the child is inside and can't come out. He's inside. And you know what this implies? The, this, this, the, the mother for this person, the role of mother, the hellfire is gonna hug him and not let him go. And be very protective and owner, you know, owning of him. Not, let, not release him. And he's trapped in it like a child trapped in the womb of the mother. SubhanAllah. فَأُمُّهُ هَاوِيَ It's a, such a powerful rendition of uh, the phrase. Then he says, وَمَا أَدْرَاكَ مَا هِيَ And what will give you a clue as to what it is? مَا هِيَ He doesn't say, وَمَا أَدْرَاكَ مَا الْهَاوِيَ 
In the beginning he said, وَمَا أَدْرَاكَ مَا الْقَارِعَةِ He didn't repeat Hawiyah, he said, وَمَا أَدْرَاكَ مَا هِيَ And the difference, this is again rhetoric in the Qur'an. The first word qari'ah was familiar to the Arabs. It was familiar. And they can compare a qari'ah they've seen, and then make qiyas about the qari'ah that's going to happen. Even though Allah teaches them, you really can't. But at least in their mind, yes, qari'ah is a familiar term. The word hawiyah, the way it's being used here, completely unfamiliar to the Arabs. Plus it's not even describing something that will happen on the earth, it's describing hellfire. Completely in the ghayb. It's distant from them. And to allude to something distant, the pronoun is used here. That's how it's used in the Qur'an. Then we find that the word at the end of this is mahiyah. There's a ha at the end. The word hiya in Arabic means she. The word hiya means she. There's no ha at the end of it. But Allah Azza wa Jal adds a ha. This is ha tahwil to terrify. This ha at the end of a word in Arabic is to magnify and to give weight to a word. When you pronounce the ha, you pronounce it from your diaphragm. And this is a means by which you are to scare your audience when you speak. This is, this is a magnification and an, and an expression of power. So Allah says, ma hiya? You have any idea what that is? And there's, a, there's an anger in the ayah and we can capture the anger in the ha that's captured at the end. Wal ha fi hiya lil وَالْجُمْلَةَ تَفْسِيرُ تُفِيدُ التَّعْظِيمُ أَمْرٌ أَمْرِ النَّارُ وَتَفْخِيمِهِ This ha at the end, is the, it benefits magnifying the matter of fire and to give it its, its heavy weight. Last ayah inshaAllah ta'ala, نَارٌ حَامِيَةً He asked the question, he answers it. Why does he answer it? Because he said, مَا أَدْرَاكَ If he says, مَا يُدْرِيكَ you don't find answer. When he says, ma adraka, you find answer. The first question was, ma, ma adraka ma al we found an answer. Now another question, ma adraka ma hiya. And now we're gonna find the answer again. By the way, this is a surah about hellfire. In the end, it's about more detail about hellfire. The surah before and the surah after talks about the kind of people that deserve hellfire. It's sandwiched in between them. The surah before, in al insana, li rabbihi lakanud. The surah after, Al-Hakum Al-Takathur, Hatta Zurtum Al-Maqabir. Both of the groups that need to be warned. And in between the two groups, you have a surah that deals with their fate, the hellfire. Ay Haratun Shadida, Al-Harar, Al-Harara. The word nar, of course, we know is fire. The word hamia means intense fire, something that's very, very hot and 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 flamed. Wa huwa jawabul istifham. It's of course the answer to the question mahiya tafsir li hawiya. This is a tafsir of the word hawiya itself. Na'atul lahu wa lahu na'atul lahu lahu wa min al hima. This is an adjective of fire, and it comes from the word hima, which means istidad istidad al har. It means the intensity of flame and fire. Of course, we learn from prophetic narrations of the Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that the fire of hell is at least 70 times, meaning the fire we have here in the world is one of 70 parts of the fire in hell and its intensity. May Allah Azza wa Jal protect us from it. And Al-Qamus, it even says, you know, Humiya Shams, meaning the sun's flame is called Hima also. Its, its intensity is called Hima also at that place. Not the one that reaches us, but the one that's over there is called Hima also. So with that inshaAllah ta'ala we conclude. I want to just mention one or two things about the coherence of the surah and how it's tied, the beginning of it is tied to the end of it. Allah Azza wa Jal scared us in the beginning with the word Al-Qari'ah. He scares us more at the end with the words Narun Hamiya. He opened the surah with a question and an answer. وَمَا أَضْرَكَ مَا الْقَارِعَةِ He closes the surah with a question and answer. وَمَا أَضْرَكَ مَا هِيَ نَارٌ حَامِيَةٌ So the beginning is rhetorically tied to its own conclusion. بارك الله لي ولكم في القرآن الحكيم ونفعني وإياكم بالآية والذكر الحكيم والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم القارعة ما القارعة وما أدراك ما القارعة يوم يكون الناس كالفراش المبثوث وتكون الجبال كالعهن المنفوش فأما من ثقلت موازينه فهو في عيشة راضية وأما من خفت موازينه فأمه هاوية وما أدراك ما هي نار حامية